pray that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to teach your word. That I just humble myself to you in your presence and that everything I say will edify, exhort, and comfort the church to take back everything that the devil has stolen from us and from Christians in the body of Christ. Lord, I just bind the devil. I rebuke him. I command his Satan, uh, his enemies, all of his um, demons, his devils, um, to stop in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, and that your ministering angels will bring back everything that was lost from us, by the riches of your glory. It's the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Blessed Holy Ghost that I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to get right into the material. I have 10 lies that if you believe them, you have been stolen by the devil and by Satan. And what I have found is that these 10 issues, no matter what religion it is, if it's Muslims, Jehovah Witness, Atheists, anything, right? They keep saying these same questions and points to try to combat Jesus or argue against Christianity. And so I wanted to know if you believed any of these lies, what would you lose, right? So there's only two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, right? And so what is the devil doing when he puts these questions into the minds of believers and also in the minds of unbelievers, right? And I just wanted to note that um, these are doctrines of devils. These are what people with a reprobate mind will have, but you'll also see it within the actual church, in the actual church body. And so here are the 10. So number one, um, people say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Number two, they say that you do not need to fear God. Um, number three, Jesus wasn't his real name. Number four, there's always a fight about legalism or being religious uh, when you try to talk about holiness. Number five, you don't have to go to church to have a relationship with God. Lie from the devil. Number six, the separation of church and state. Number seven, Jesus didn't exist. He didn't live. He didn't resurrect, right? Um, number eight, the Bible was changed. The Bible is not the word of God. Number nine, spiritual gifts have stopped. They have ceased. Um, speaking in tongues isn't real. And then number 10, I'm a good person. We're all children of God. So I just went to the Bible, the word of God, and I went one by one seeing what do you lose or what does the devil gain if you believe any of these lies. So we're going to start with um, number one, Jesus did not die on the cross. And so I'll, I usually hear this argument from Muslims. Um, and so I just went to the Bible of like, hey, what is the importance of Jesus specifically dying on the cross? So you have Leviticus 17, verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth, it shall be cut off. All right. So we are established in the Bible that the life is in the blood. So if Jesus never died on the cross. There is no blood. There is no life. And so this is what we find in John chapter one. It says the life is in him. Right. So you need Jesus to have life at all. You also see this in Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their life unto death. And so right there, the way that a Christian overcomes, the way that a Christian defeats the devil is by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. If he never died on the cross, there is no bloodshed. There is no remission of sins. And so you have Hebrews 9 and 22. And by the law, almost all things are purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so we know that Jesus came into the world 
that he could destroy the works of the devil and also that our sins may be forgiven. So again, Hebrews 9 and 22 says, where there is no bloodshed, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so if Jesus never died on the cross, you are yet in your sin, you are yet going into hell. And so if you do not receive the atonement, the payment of Jesus for your sins, because he lived a perfect and blameless life, holy, um, this blood was so holy, it actually moves you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, having everlasting life. But you, if you do not receive the blood of Jesus on the cross, boom, you are yet in your sin. You are still going to hell. And then lastly, well, it may not be last. Yeah, it's not last. <laughs> um, you have Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All right. So it says that in the Bible, Jesus took 39 lashes to atone for our 39 sicknesses and diseases, right? So any disease in the world is bought by the blood of Jesus. And also any other iniquity in our heart, um, any transgressions that we do against one another, anything that we do in this life that's evil, it has been bought by the blood of Jesus. But if there is no bloodshed, you are still afflicted with your diseases. This is how we lay hands on the sick. This is how we pray for people to have their sins forgiven. This is how we can get freedom from the devil and his angels and demons, right? Because of the blood of Jesus. This is how we actually get access to the throne room and to the holiest of holies that we see in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And also just the altar of like just the, everything. So um, just know this. This is Isaiah 53 verse 5. And also we have 1 John in 5. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one, right? So again, uh, when Jesus got baptized um, by John the Baptist, it says that the spirit dwelt upon him. It came upon him. It says that when he was speared on the crucifixion on the cross, that water and blood came out of his side, right? And this just proved that Jesus is both the son of God and the Messiah, and he is God himself. Because uh, 1 John and 5 also says there's three that bear record in heaven. It is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, right? So this is the refute bodily of uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and became a carnate and dwelt among us, right? There's only one person who became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And so... If he bared the spirit in himself, if he bared the water in himself, if he bared um, the blood in himself, it proves that he is the only way to salvation and he is the only way of eternal life. If you do not believe in the blood, if you do not believe in the cross, if you do not believe in Jesus' resurrection, you have eternal damnation and the devil has just lied and tricked you to send your soul to hell. So that's what the devil's trying to do. He made one third of the angels um, rebel against God and boom, they got crashed into uh, exile and now they are tormented um, until the day of judgment, um, being locked up until they get thrown into eternal hellfire. He is doing the same things with humans. He's trying to make as many people as possible go to hell and Jesus is the way of salvation and you need to know this. So we also have Galatians 3 and 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is so good because it says that you are under the curse as long as you do not receive the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, because Jesus live a holy and perfect life. And you see this through Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? And so because the wages of sin is death, 
We have done evil in this life. We are worthy of hell, right? And we are worthy of the second death. But it says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus because Jesus lived a perfect life. He did not sin in thought. He did not sin in heart and iniquity. He didn't sin in any action, right? So his atonement, his blood was perfect. So he was able to purchase eternal life, but he had the atonement, the payment, where he actually gave the eternal life that he lived on this earth to us who were not worthy. It says that yet God loved us while we were yet sinners. And so this is just the great love of God. This is the great blood of God that he was so perfect, perfect enough that now we have eternal life if we believe in him. But yet, if you do not believe in the blood of Jesus, you're still under the curse. You're under the curse of the law. You're under the curse of all the wickedness of this world, all sin, all disease, all death, all burdens, um, depression, um, suicidal thoughts. All of that, it says the wrath of God is yet on you, right? So you need the blood of God to have freedom because it says in his word that the, the law was weak for it was not able to save but we um, obey not the letter, but the spirit of it. And this is how you can actually come into receiving the Holy Spirit. So if you do not have the blood of Jesus, if you do not receive the work on the cross, you don't even have the Holy Spirit able to dwell on the inside of you. And this is Ephesians 1 and 13, that the Holy Spirit is the seal of salvation. So you can't even have eternal life because you do not receive the Holy Spirit. So that's number one. They say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus did die on the cross. He resurrected on the third day. And through his blood, we have forgiveness. So number two, this is really prevalent in the church. It's a bunch of crap. Um, it says that you are not supposed to fear God. Essentially, fearing God is their argument being it's only reverencing God, right? But what do you lose if you believe this? What does the kingdom of darkness and Satan believe um, and gain if you believe that you're not supposed to fear God? It's only about love, right? So there's actually a lot. There's, this is not an extensive list, any of my arguments, but there are a lot of scriptures um, talking exactly against um, this belief. So let's go to Philippians 2 and 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But we're moving to Matthew 28, and that was uh, Philippians 2 and 12. In Matthew 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So right there in Matthew 28, that is not reverence. That is regular fear. <laughs> I'm like, yo, you fear man because they might kill you. It says, hey, you need to fear God because he will kill you and then send your soul to hell eternally, right? So you're like, oh, man, Winston, it's about love. It's always about love. Why do you have to fear God? Great question. Let's get into the text. Why do you need to fear God? This comes from Acts 13, um, verse 26. Acts 13, verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you who feareth God, to you is the word of the salvation sent. So there's a portion of reverencing honoring, acknowledging God, that you will allow him to be your Lord and Savior and humble yourself to him. You will humble yourself to his lordship and thereby you will eat or receive eternal life and their eternal inheritance of salvation. But if you do not have the fear of God, you will not enter into this salvation. Again, sending your soul to hell in damnation forever, right? So this is also 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, 
whether it be good or evil, good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. All right, so it says that your conscience is seared and hardened against God without the fear of the Lord. And it says, because you know that the terror of the Lord of the day of judgment will come upon all men, we persuade God, I mean, we persuade men to repent unto God that they will not be destroyed in eternal hellfire and eternal destruction. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, the reason that we have the fear of the Lord and the terror of God, it makes you more evangelistic. It makes people repent because this is a terrible day for all those who have not received the blood of Jesus and have not received the atonement and forgiveness of sins because you will experience eternal hellfire for the rest of your days. And so if the church is always focused on love, there is an apathy, there is a laziness, there is a slothfulness that the church does not win souls. You go into your schools, you go into your workplaces, you go into the gym, you go into the store, and you tell nobody of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the good news, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. And so if you want to tell everybody about the good news of Jesus, what is the good news of Jesus? That you will not go to hell, that Jesus is going to judge the world for all that they have done at the judgment seat of Christ, the anointed one. And so you need this salvation, this eternal life, that you do not receive eternal judgment for all of eternity. So people need the fear of the Lord, so they repent. <laughs> they turn from their wicked ways. They feel sorrowful for their sins, and they change their mind and stop sinning. And so a church that doesn't speak on hell, a church that doesn't speak on repentance, a church that speak, does not speak on the day of judgment will win nobody to the kingdom of God and it will be lifeless. It will not be spirit filled. It will not have manifestations of his glory or his presence. And so that's so important. If you do not have the fear of the Lord, you do not have the presence of God. And so that's why everything looks like it does not work. Um, everything looks like there is no effect of Christianity. And so where there is no power, there is no repentance, there is no soul winning for the kingdom, all right? And this is also said in Jude 1, um, verses like 22 and 23. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and on others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And so Galatians 5 says, the works of the flesh are made manifest, um, enmity, striving, gossiping, lying, sexual immorality, homosexuality, all this stuff, right? Um, listen in Galatians 5. But it says, people who are of the spirit, walk in the spirit, and are made manifest with goodness, kindness, meekness, gentleness, love, joy, peace, self-control, kindness. I think, I think that's all nine, all right? And so... Um, it says that we should have a holy indignation, a holy anger with the fact that people are being tormented by the devil. People are being tormented by sin. People are being tormented by his demons and his legions because they are still walking by the flesh, being spotted with iniquity, with transgressions, with sin. The blood of Jesus has bought them that they should be clothed in white raiment, um, receiving um, just the righteousness of Christ, right? But if you do not receive him as your Lord and Savior, you look like filthy rags. And so it says, no unholy thing, no unclean thing will enter into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God. So you should hate that. You should put the fear of God on people of if you die today, you will die and go to hell but we don't want to talk about hell no more. And we lose an evangelistic anointing and effectiveness because we do not preach the way the Bible says to preach. Just be honest, tell people the truth and let the chips fall where they may, right?
And I also want to go into all the blessings of the fear of the Lord. It's like, wait, the fear of the Lord got a bunch of good stuff? And it's not all this rebuke and negative stuff? Yes, there's a bunch of positive stuff for the fear of the Lord. And it starts with Psalms 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. So it says right there, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father only tells his secrets to the children who fear him. So when things come into the world, like pandemics, COVID-19, all this um, famine, pestilence, pestilences, right, that are um, talked about in the Gospels, he will warn his children that fear him and he will make provision for them. But it says that you will be overtaken in that day if you do not know him. And so what we found at the start of 2020 is that a bunch of professing Christians or believers were slothful. They were slack and they were slumbering and they got caught. If COVID-19 and 2020 was the day of judgment, a lot of us would have went to hell. And so that's just the reality of like, hey, God tells his secrets to those who fear him. And so this is the spirit of revelation. Also, you have Proverbs 16 and 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And so this is how we actually get people to truly repent and not be lukewarm in the church, not be sinning and living double lives in the church, where it says you actually receive mercy. So a lot of people, number one, they're able to sin and be professing Christians because number one, they do not have the Holy Spirit. They have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's why you don't have power to live a holy and pure life. But also, um, they don't have grace and empowerment to continue on. But it says you will receive mercy. So this is why it says come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy in Hebrews um, 4. So this is very important that we need the mercy of God to do anything effective for his kingdom and be effective in our business, in our relationships, in our families, with our friends, in our schooling, right? You also have Deuteronomy 6 and 17. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. Right. So if I do not have the fear of the Lord, I'm not going to listen to what he says. I don't care because I'm reprobating. Psalms 145 verse 19. He will fulfill the desires of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. So some of us, you don't just need salvation saving. Sometimes you have made a problem where you can't solve it. Right. So you need the Lord to save you. So it also says he will fulfill the desires of them. So a lot of us live lives where we do not get prayers answered. It says right there, God answers the prayers of those who fear them. There's so many conditional promises of God. And so if I do not fear him, he's not obligated to answer my prayers. It says that God does not hear the prayers of the wicked. It's pretty interesting, right? So if you are wicked, if you're sinfully, if you're sinning, with just lawfulness, you're going to hear, away from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, um, go into like everlasting fire on the day of judgment. You're not going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servants. But also he says he fulfills the desires of them who fear, fear him, right? So if you feel as if you have no purpose in life, you have no meaning to your life, right? It says the Lord gives meaning or fulfills the desires, like what you want, and drives purpose to those who fear him. So if I have no meaning in my life, I have no purpose in my life, it may be because I do not fear God, all right? You have Proverbs 15 and 16. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than with great treasures and troubles therewith. So a lot of people actually experience this. They're rich, but the riches don't come from God. They're living evil lives. You see this with famous people. You see this with celebrities, right? And they always want to thank God for their acceptance speeches. But we see in Luke 4 that when Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit to go into the desert, um, into the wilderness to be tried by Satan, Satan offered him riches, glory, um, possessions, power, all this lust 
because there's only three temptations and three sins in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And so it says right there, better is the fear of the Lord with little than have everything you want um, and have great treasures, right? And so it says right there, if you obey God, you may lose everything. And we don't have this gospel in the gospel of Jesus Christ any longer that, hey, you might lose everything being obedient to the Bible, being obedient to the word of God. And what you get is a bunch of spectators versus servants. <laughs> you get a bunch of consumers versus Christ followers, right? So you don't get people who are actually disciples, but people are mainly just cheerleaders in the church, right? They don't die daily. They don't pick up their cross. They don't evangelize. They don't give. They do nothing, right? And so uh, it says that in the book of Acts, that the fear of the Lord was upon the church when Sapphira and Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit when they stole portion back when they said they sold their land and gave to the poor, right? And then it said through Peter, you did not lie to me. You lied to the Holy Ghost. And then boom, God killed them dead, right? Because um, this is what happened, that the presence of God was so potent, right? And we see this all throughout in the Old Testament, right? You have to be like, yo, why did the judgment of God come so quick in the Old Testament? versus the judgment of God coming so quick and being delayed in the New Testament, right? This is from John Brevere's book, The Fear of the Lord, right? So what you have is God's patterns. In God's patterns, you have divine order, the presence of God, and divine judgment, right? So when you get things in order, you do what God says, his presence becomes amplified, magnified, and then his judgment comes quicker, right? And so you see this um, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? It says that the earth was formless and without void and void. And then the spirit of the Lord hovered among the waters and he just began creating, right? And he determined on each day that it was good. So you have divine order. Everything was in chaos, right? And then you have the presence of God. The spirit of the Lord dwelt, hovered among the waters. And then you have divine judgment. God uh, made man and woman in his image and he said it was good. He made the stars and the planets and everything else determine it was good. He made the fish and the creeping, creeping things and the crawl. It was good, right? But when God was leading the people of Israel um, out of Egypt into the promised land, it said that his presence... Remember, so divine um, order, Moses, he told Moses, um, tell Pharaoh to go, um, let my people go so they can go worship me in the wilderness. And I'll lead them into um, the good land, right? And so that's divine order. Boom, his presence came. He came in the pillar of fire in the cloud, right? And so his presence was there. But what do we see? that the children of Israel did not understand about God's presence. God's presence has divine judgment very quick. You see that the, the land opened up and swallowed them for their murmuring and complaining. God hates that. He hates that in the New Testament as well. Um, they would just accuse God and do a bunch of evil and wicked stuff and they'll be perverse. They would uh, rise up to play and fornicate, having sex outside of marriage, and all this evil stuff. And then they had snakes, the judgment of God, bite them and kill them. They have all these plagues. All this wild stuff was happening, right? Why? Because they did not have the fear of the Lord, and they spoke out against God. They judged him. And they did just like um, the devil and his angels. The spirit of pride was upon them. And so they did all this wickedness before the sight of the Lord. And so this is why... The judgment of God came so quick on them. And so um, same thing with the New Testament, right? So Jesus told his disciples to wait here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit come upon you, right? So he told this uh, both after his resurrection to 500, right? But it says in the upper room, the number actually got willed down to 125 or 120, right? So people fell off, right? So the more that people fall off, 
the more the more the presence of God, the potency of his presence came because these were very devout men, right? And then after that, boom, the Holy Spirit came. They were speaking in tongues. They were operating in power. They said that they were pricking the hearts of those um, through their preaching and evangelism. So why were they so effective to evangelize through preaching 4,000 people get converted? Why? The spirit of God, the potency of his presence was so effective that they won souls for the kingdom. And this is what the fear of the Lord said. When Ananias and Sapphira died, it said that the fear of the Lord came to everybody, right? They're like, yo, God is real. You can't be fooling with him. You can't, <laughs> you can't be messing around with him. And so it says nobody was added to their number, yet the Lord had chosen to be saved. And so this is the problem when we have secret friendly churches where we do not preach hell. We do not preach the um, fear of the Lord. We do not um, preach repentance or the day of judgment. What gets added is not those that should be saved, but a bunch of consumers versus Christ followers. And so you have a bunch of people who are lukewarm Christians, which means you're not a Christian at all. And so you're actually going to hell deceiving yourself, uh, which is written in Galatians, right? So um, this is how you have true converts versus false converts by having the fear of the Lord, where there's true repentance in heart. And you actually yield to the lordship of God versus rebelling against. And so that moves to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. Right there. You always hear the fear of the Lord being like, man, a whole bunch of bad stuff going to happen. It says if you have the fear of the Lord, you will have riches, you will have honor, and you will have life. Right? Because I will hear his voice and I will obey his voice. And it says that the blessing of God maketh one rich, right? So a lot of people are broke because you do not have the fear of the Lord. And I do not say like this to be like apathetic to that. Sometimes you just need understanding. Um, it says that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And it says my people do err because they do not know the scriptures. And so if we don't know what the Bible says about, hey, this is how you enter into the riches. This is how you enter into the promises of God. This is how people put respect on your name and um, how you enter into life, right? Um, you'll never enter into the blessing of Abraham and the covenant of Abraham. And so you just need to know like, hey man, the fear of the Lord is where you get riches, honor, and life. And a lot of people are dying prematurely because if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you know obey the Bible, you don't not heed his commandments, and you do your own thing. And then, boom, you die because, number one, you might just do a bunch of things that you just get the consequences of life. If I have sex outside of marriage, and then some dude gets jealous, and then he shoots me because I had sex with a girl he liked or something, boom! I was getting whatever I reap. I sold in iniquity, I sold in the flesh, and what I get? I got the flesh back. And so, that's really important that you know like sometimes the judgment of God or his grace lifting off of you because it says they who humble themselves under the mighty hand of God will be exalted but those who exalt themselves shall be abased you'll be made low and sometimes that's just circumstances in life sometimes that's just the judgment of God um, you have to have discernment to know which is which next we have Exodus 18 verse 21 moreover thou shalt provide out of all people Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, uh, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of themselves and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And then you also have Second Samuel verse, I mean chapter twenty-three, verse three. The God of Israel said, "The Rock of Israel spake to me that ruleth over men must be just." ruling in the fear of God. So right there, the Bible actually outlines that you need to have Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who have the fear of the Lord and wisdom to govern all of your places. So if you don't like your boss, it may be because they don't have the fear of the Lord. They're treating people so ugly. And so the Bible says you need people um, in your government, in your schools, in your workplaces, everywhere, to lead with the fear of the Lord. Otherwise, a bunch of bad stuff happens because you are not able to spiritually discern 
how to fix something and how to seek the face of God to get your answers. And so I'm not going to speak on it. I'm just going to say I live in the United States. A bunch of crazy stuff has happened since there has been a changing of the candidacy and the presidency, right? But this is what happens when you put people as your mayors, as your governors, as your presidents, as your emperors, or whatever they have in England, <laughs> or your kings and queens, right? Um, they must rule with the fear of the Lord. Or it says even in the Bible, when um, the wicked are in power, the people cry out. It just says a bunch of horrible stuff happens when evil people or sinners are in leadership. So you don't want that. You want the fear of the Lord. And so if you want to be a really good leader, you need to fear the Lord. You need to obey his commandments. You need to do what the Bible says. You need to read the Bible. You need to humble yourself and um, just do whatever it says. All right. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. So a lot of people, there is an identity crisis. You don't know what you're supposed to do with your life. You don't know if your life has purpose. You, you don't know you're just going aimless. There is no fulfillment, right? It says right there, there's only two things to do in this life. The fear of the Lord and do what he says. That will give your whole life fulfillment. So you think that you're having fulfillment of doing what makes you happy, but it says that sin is sensational. It cannot be satisfied. So I know this is not applicable, but it says that hell opens her throat to make room for how many people are coming into it, right? Because there are so many people operating out of appetite, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, doing whatever they see as good in their own eyes. But it says there is a way that looks good to a man that leads only to death. All these things that you are wanting God to give you, you're praying for, or you're taking, because you cannot get God to answer your prayers. And this comes from James 4. It says, um, you do strife, you do war, because you do not ask God and you do not receive, right? But it also says, when you do ask God, you do not receive of him because you do ask of your own lust and you ask amiss. So, right, there are certain things and it says in Proverbs that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart, right? And so you have a lot of things attached to you. Some of your appetites are not actually your own appetites. It's not your own identity. A lot of people say, I'm born this way. It says in the Bible in John 3, you need to be born again. So there is no life in you. You have no life, but it says, he who delights himself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Jesus will give you a new heart where you think like, man, I have no hope. I'll always have a problem with this. I'll always masturbate. I'll always watch porn. I'll always have sex outside of marriage. I'll always smoke weed. I'll always get drunk. Blah, 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 blah. Right? It says right there, he'll give you a new heart and you won't like these things. So a lot of us do not know that these things, these appetites that you have, they're not even you. They are devils. They are a fallen world in a sin nature. They're actually demons. And this is why Jesus has come into the world to destroy the works of the, de the devil. And so if you always identify to something that the Lord hasn't called you to, it says that we are supposed to conform to the image of Christ and his likeness, right? So did Jesus have an alcohol issue? No. Did Jesus have a suicidal thought issue? No. Did Jesus have a depression issue? No. Because Isaiah 61 says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good tidings upon the meek, um, to bind up the brokenhearted, the spirit of liberty, to all that are captive, right? That's the spirit of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. And so we have freedom through Christ Jesus. But if I do not have fear of the Lord, I do not have freedom. I do not have a new heart. I do not have his desires. I do not love what he loves. I do not hate what he hates. And Lord hates iniquity that's sitting in your heart, sitting in your heart. So we go to Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a a snare, but who so putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Let's say that again. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but who so putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So it says right there, a lot of people, you actually obey men. You are afraid of people. We call this peer pressure, but it says it snares you. 
So a lot of us, we're doing a bunch of things with a bunch of people who actually do not like us, right? But we only do that because we fear man. We give in to peer pressure. So we're taking jobs that we do not want. We're doing activities and going bars and clubs that we do not like. Why? Because we are operating under the spirit of fear. But it says in his word, he has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, right? So you have to repent. You have to rebuke the spirit of fear because it's a, it's a literal entity on you, right? So you need to claim the blood of Jesus upon your life that you do not obey the fear of man any longer and that spirit will be removed from you. You're supposed to cast out demons. You have to command that this demon of the spirit of fear and the spirit, the fear of man will come out in the name of Jesus by the blood of Jesus. And boom, it will come out of you, right? You have Galatians 1 and 10. For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be able to be the servant of Christ. You can't even be effective in the kingdom abiding by the fear of the Lord. God's going to make you separate from people. God's going to make you move. God's going to make you pray and isolate. Why? Because you need to be fit for the master's use. So a lot of us are not fit for the master's use. We don't win no souls. We don't cast out no demons. We don't heal nobody. We don't prophesy. We don't speak in tongues. We don't operate in miracles or discernment in spirits. Why? We do not have the fear of the Lord. We do not know him. We do not have his presence. We're supposed to be altars. We're supposed to be lively stones. We're supposed to be living epistles of Christ. And this is how we actually win people to the kingdom for the fruits of God, right? The fruits of the spirit. And so um, this is how we're effective in our ministry. Um, fear of the Lord, Hebrews 5, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard that he feared him. Again, God only listens to the prayers of those who fear him. That's Hebrews 5, right? And also we have Psalms 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is the goodness, thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that feared thee, when thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee, before the sons of man. So there's a bunch of inheritances. There's a bunch of blessings. There's a bunch of good things for who? Not everybody. All of God's promises are conditional. It says that there are only good things to those who fear the Lord. All right. Psalms 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamped about, Psalms 34 and 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. It says that God gives angels to who? Everybody? No! He gives help and angels to the service of those who fear him. So sometimes you need some angelic intervention. You need that Daniel fast <laughs> so that the spirit of Persia, the principalities warring against your life, will have help from the archangel Michael. So there's levels to spiritual wickedness. There's levels to the kingdom of darkness and you need to know that you need angelic intervention and so you also have psalms 33 verse 18 behold the eye of the lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy again you'll take mercy and you also have the eye of the lord watching you when he says i'll never forsake you and i'll never leave you lonely i'll never leave you i'll never forsake you Yo, his eye is with you. And so there's encouragement. There's boldness. There's security and peace to those who fear the Lord. You don't fear the Lord. You have no peace. You're doing a bunch of wickedness. You're sinning. And then the wrath of God, the judgment of God, you can literally feel that it's tangible on you, right? When you do not repent and believe. You have Psalms 34, verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. So it says right there that when you lack and when you do not have enough, you do not have the fear of the Lord. It says there is no want. There is no lack to those who fear him. Because again, the blessing of the Lord make up one rich, right? It says that um, Joshua verse, no, Joshua chapter one, verse like seven to nine, 
that you need to meditate on his word night and day and that you will make your way prosperous. That's why you have to fear the Lord in his presence. Next, we have Jeremiah 32 and 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So a lot of us, or some of us, we have an up and down relationship with God, right? Um, sometimes we pray, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we read our Bible, sometimes we don't. This backslidden state is because of a lack of the fear of the Lord. It says that he will actually keep that we may not depart from him. And this is how we stop having false converts. By having, it doesn't say the love of God, it says having the fear of the Lord. Definitely have the love of God. That is very important for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who should ever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But the blessings of the fear of the Lord can't be overlooked. You have Exodus 1 and 21. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that they made God gave them houses, right? So it says right there, you can actually get properties. You can get inheritances. You can get possessions by the fear of the Lord. And so if you are always a borrower and not a lender, right? If you're always below and not above, if you're always beneath, right? Um, and if you're always the last and not the first, it may be because you do not have the fear of the Lord. And also, um, that story about the midwives, Pharaoh commanded that all the Israelite children should be thrown and killed, um, like thrown into the river and killed and so on and so forth. The midwives say, nope, we're not going to do it. We're going to save them because God is a God of life. You cannot abort your kids. And so um, God actually saved the midwives and gave them homes. And so sometimes rebelling against wickedness in your government or over your overlords, right, is necessary and called by the fear of the Lord. So anybody that's trying to get you to sin that goes against the Bible, right, um, you do not have to obey them if it goes against the Bible. And so God actually bless them. So sometimes we're so apathetic, we're so lukewarm, we're so casual, we just let our government, our rulers, all these evil principalities do whatever they want. And you get no blessing. We are called helpers of the war in 2 Timothy 2. So why do we war a good warfare? Because we need to fight against our foe, the devil, and his wiles, the way that he tricks. All right, we're going to Psalms 25, verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach the way that he shall choose. So a lot of us, we have a lot of options in life. When it comes to career, when it comes to schooling, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to relationships, so on and so forth, right? It says, when you fear the Lord, the Lord will make your choice clear, right? So if you're lacking clarity in your life or just hearing God, God telling you what to do, it's most likely that you do not humble yourself in your Lord. Psalms 128 verse 1, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for them shall eat the labor of his hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as the fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like the olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man that fear the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee of Zion, number Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. There is so much in this verse, in this scripture. It says like, hey, you're single. You don't want to be single. If you have the fear of the Lord, the Lord might bless you with a wife, right? We're all not called to marriage. Uh, but it says that he who finds the wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It also says that God will withhold no good thing from thee. And it says um, that it is not good for man to be alone. Right? So if you're single and you're struggling, maybe you can't get your prayers answered because you do not have the fear of the Lord. You're praying all these marriage prayers or whatever, but if you ain't humble, you live in sin, God ain't giving you no husband. He ain't giving you no, <laughs> he ain't giving you no wife. It also says that 
Um, you will eat the labors of your hands. So a lot of us, we have a lack of fulfillment in our careers and we have a lack of fulfillment at our jobs. Why? If you do not have the fear of the Lord, if you do not heed to his commandments, you may be in a workplace you're not supposed to be in or you do not work unto the Lord. It says, do not work unto man with eye service, but work unto your Lord who is like your ultimate boss, right? And so this is in the New Testament. So if I'm, if I'm a lazy Christian, if I'm a slothful Christian, if I'm a sluggard, all this stuff that Proverbs speaks against, it says that poverty will overtake you like a strong man. And so you might have a stronghold in your life because you're lazy. And why? Why are you lazy? Because you don't work into God because you don't have the fear of the Lord. Of whatever you do in this life, good or bad, you're going to be judged on the day of judgment even your workplace. And so you pray for this job, like, Lord, give me this job, give me this job. And then when you got this job, it's like, Lord, give me a new job, give me a new job. I don't like it here. Why? Because you're ungrateful. You're unthankful. And this is why the children of Israelite, I mean, Israel got killed so many times because it says they are unthankful. They did not reverence God. And so if you do not have the fear of the Lord, you do not reverence God. And you murmur. And Psalms 103, verse 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Again, he is mercy to those who fear him. Psalms 111. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. All right, God has a covenant that he will take care of us. We are his children. He will bless us. And it says that he gives meat, food to those who fear him. So again, poverty and lack came at the fall of man because there was no lack in the Garden of Eden when Adam was in the coolness of the day, walking with God in his presence. Where God's presence is, there is plenty, there is blessing, there is sufficiency, right? It says, um, all those who fear God, they will want no good thing, all right? Why? Because God's presence has all our needs. It says that he will supply all our need, one, singular, because we only need Christ Jesus, according to his riches and glory. You need the glory of God. You need the presence of God so that you are not impoverished. You need to make sure that you are not spiritually bankrupt and you are not naturally bankrupt either by the fear of the Lord. You need this life that you can obtain mercies, blessings, and riches, honors, and life. All right. Psalms 1, 15, and 11. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help in their shield. Yo, Sometimes you need a defense. You, we do not war with warfare um, that is carnal, that is flesh and blood, but our weapons of warfare are spiritual. There are rulers, there are witness, there are an angel, devil, his angels, and the devil, I mean, his demons. So you need to know this. And so, bro, you need God as a shield. You need God to protect you. People are crazy. They are shooting people. They are robbing people. They are stabbing people out here. They are raping. They are molesting people. You need to fear the Lord to protect you. Um, and you can hear, um, it's kind of sad that all this crazy stuff be happening in the church. Why? If you let sin happen in the church, you don't rebuke people. You don't correct them. You don't sit them down. You don't cast them out. That walk deceitfully among you that the Bible in the New Testament says, like, yo, don't let them be in the church. What happens? Evil happens. Where God isn't, there is no truth. And so there's an apathy in the church to let everything go and let everything happen. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord stops itself. It's a shield. And so sometimes spirit-led believers need to be that shield of sex trafficking, knowing and recognizing when um, people are in physical violence. And if you are not spiritually mature, if you're not humble, if you do not have the fear of the Lord, you do not hear from him. You cannot be effective. And this is how sin runs rampant in the church, with Christians, in the body of Christ. And lastly, uh, again, where I got the materials for this Fear of the Lord portion is from John Bevere's book, The Fear of the Lord. It breaks down the Fear of the Lord, excellent, because you need to house the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and his glory, right? Where a Christian is ineffective is the absence of God's presence. And if I do not have reverence, if I do not have the fear of the Lord, I do not have the glory of God, I do not have his power, all right? Third, you ever wonder, I think it's the weirdest thing that keeps coming up that they keep saying Jesus wasn't his real name. There was no J in the Hebrew Bible. 
there's a secret name that they're a bunch of lies from the devil, right? So just so you know, in the Hebrew language, um, the J or what, well, it wasn't really a J, it was a Y, right? So you have God being called um, Jehovah, but also called Yeshua, right? So you also have um, Jesus, right? Jesus' root to his name comes from the word Joshua. So in the Hebrew language, it, his name would not be Joshua, right? His name would be Yahshua, right? So it's just like when you speak Spanish, right? Um, you, you say me llamo. That double L has a Y sound. And so this is like the big holy moly or whatever against Christianity and Jesus of like, there is no J, there is no J. Uh, Jesus' name comes from a slave ship. It was not from a slave ship. It comes from Joshua, Yahshua, all right? And he had a name before all names under heaven and earth. And you don't know what you lose if you believe this crap, right? So I want to list out everything you lose if you actually believe that Jesus wasn't his real name and you actually believe that his name came from a slave ship and all these other lies of the devil. It comes from Acts verse 4, number 12, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So God puts a stipulation that men must be saved by the name of Jesus only. And so people who don't even know phonics properly, right? They're like, oh, his name came like this and like that, blah, blah, blah. That's not how phonics work. That's not how language works at all. So you need to rebuke the lies of the devil, and you need to correct people when they're speaking idiocy, idiocy, dumbness, um, because it's asinine. And so you need to know that, like, it's, Jesus says, like, God says, Jesus was the way of salvation. It says, before the foundations of the earth, the Lord already predestined him to, like, die on the cross, resurrect from the third day, that we may inherit eternal life and eternal salvation, right? So it says, there is no name under heaven or earth where men must be saved. It says you must be saved by Jesus. There is no Muhammad. There is no Buddha. There is no Charles T. Russell. There is no Confucianism. There is no atheism, agnostic. All them other names must bow to the name of Jesus Christ. It says every tongue will confess, every knee shall bow to the name of the Lord Christ Jesus. So if you do not believe in the name, you don't have salvation. Again, the devil just sent you hell. All right, you have Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when you're trying to do all this new age witchcraft, all this demonic stuff, all this Satanist stuff, that you're trying to get your chakras, you're trying to do your horoscopes, you're trying to do your zodiac signs and all this crap, right? That only opens you up to devils and demons that you are actually bond to the occult, right? But it says in the Bible right there, if you want your prayers to get answered, if you want to get saved, it said this new age manifestation crap, right? Because it says that a diligent hand make one rich, it doesn't say, say whatever you want out of your flesh and of your lust, and God will answer you. No. It says in James 4, you do ask and ask amiss. Why? So you can assume it of your own lust. First John and 5, we know that God hears us, but we ask according to his will. So you need to humble yourself with the fear of the Lord, knowing that God is God. He is sovereign. He is Lord of your life to do whatever he wants. So if you want your prayers to be answered, and to be saved, eternal life. You need the fear of the Lord, and you need the name of Jesus. All those who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. God will help you if you say Jesus. Boom, he will help you. John 14 and 14. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is how you pray effectively. This is how you get prayers answered. If you ask anything in his name according to his will, according to his Bible, You'll get answered in the name of Jesus. You say, Father, in the name of Jesus. Whatever <laughs> uh, that the Lord says, he says he'll give houses to those who do not build. These are the promises of God. So right there, Jesus' name is important to your prayers. And then you have Revelation 19 and 12. 
His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture, dipped with in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So again, John 1 and 1, Jesus with, I mean, in the beginning was the Word, where it was with God, the Word was God. So Jesus is the Word. And so this is how you bear witness of like, man, this is the Word that you believe on. It says, in him um, was the light of man, and in him was life. You have no life without Jesus. So boom, the devil just stole life from you if you do not believe in his name. Whew.